Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's event uh, called Are We All Yimbies Now? Um, I'm sure all on the call are familiar, but just in case, uh, the term refers to yes in my backyard, which is a, uh, a way of expressing uh, a desire and, and uh, in, in favour of uh, development of different uh, persuasions rather than necessarily being against it, which is often called uh, NIMBY, which is not in my back yard. Um, we wanted to do the event today, uh, I think two reasons, two motivations really. One, I think it was based on our reflections of being at um, party conference and the season that we've just uh, had. And very, to varying degrees, all three of the, the main parties were talking about housing. I think probably it's fair to say that uh, Labour had the most extensive and expansive discussion and policy platform as it exists at the moment on housing. But the other two main parties were also discussing uh, housing in various um, ways. So that was kind of one reason we wanted to do it. The second reason is um, that um, the levelling up uh, and Regeneration Act, as it's now called, it was the bill, but is now an act, has come into being. And obviously, there's quite a lot of planning stuff in it. And I think that begs the question as to how significant the act uh, might be, could be, will be. So there's two motivations. And then the third one, I think, is that, uh, well, Tom, I'm sure she, she, she will say a bit more about that. We're going to get the MPPF uh, updates on uh, on the on that as well. So there's kind of different aspects that are coming together. And finally, finally, um, we are at some point um, next year probably going to get a general election. So there's a kind of question about the extent to which housing and planning reform, but certainly housing features as part of the debates and the discussions as we get into that general election uh, period. And we've got three fantastic panelists to explore all of these issues in lots of different ways. Um, we're going to hear from the panelists very shortly. I'll introduce them. We've also got a poll to kick us off. And obviously, as always, there is the Q&A function, which you can put your queries and questions into the Q&A or via the Q&A function. And I'll pick them up as we go and field them and fire them at our three panelists. So before I introduce the panelists, I'm going to say to my colleague, can we get the first poll up on screen. That would be amazing. So fairly straightforward, give you 10 or 15 seconds. So how big an influence will housing and planning reform uh, ha have in the run up to the general election? So it's not how big you think it should be, but how big do you think it will have in reality? And you've got three major, some or little or no influence. If you vote, um, just um, make a choice, those on the call, we'll give you five seconds and then we'll whip up the answer. And uh, and then I'll introduce the panelists so they can reflect on that. Okay, let's get the answer. So, uh, middle of the road, uh, very good. So 56% some influence, 11% uh, no influence or little influence, and a third thing, it will have a major uh, influence. So I get panelists to, uh, to reflect on that in a second, but let me introduce them. So first off, we have Emma Carriago, who's the director of British Land, then we've got Tom Dobson, who's Managing Director of Quad. And we have Anthony Breach, my colleague, who's a Senior Analyst at Centre for Cities. So, Tom, let, let me come to you. I was going to try to do it in sort of three chunks. Let's just have a general, where are we now in the housing and sort of planning world? You know, how is you're in it all day, every day? How would you describe this sort of situation? And then any reflections on the uh, the poll and then I'll get Emma similarly and, uh, and and then we'll move on to what we think is good or not so good in the act and how important that will be so Tom give us a feel for where we are um well I think in, in planning world we're probably about as bad as it's ever been in my career in many ways um the system has ground to a halt um there is great uncertainty as a planning advisor. It's difficult to advise applicants and clients on whether they will or won't get planning permission, how it would be dealt with on appeal, etc. And I, I, it's a huge problem at the moment. Um, and I think part of that is a result of the kind of the the botched reforms from the kind of move fast and break things 2020 white paper, which then became the LERB. Then you had all of the conflicts in Parliament over the LERB. We're still waiting for the MPPF to see what that looks like. But that has meant that local authorities have slowed down and 
many have stopped doing things and it's meant that applicants uh, are just uncertain about where to go and with political uncertainty around elections and so on. And then obviously combined with that, we've got the kind of perfect storm of a strong cyclical downturn. Planning applications have been falling, planning permissions have been falling and starts and completions are falling quite significantly as well. And the numbers are going to be looking pretty bad this year. And then I think in addition to that, that because that's a cyclical change to some extent, we've then got a structural change as well. So with the rise in interest rates, we've got kind of an end to free money. Um, with construction costs, we've seen an increase in construction cost inflation and the changes associated with second staircases and other things which have, have increased construction costs as well. And then over time, we're going to see the kind of increasing focus on net zero as well. So that structure, the cyclical change, we all hope, will go away at some point, but the structural change is still there. And I think overall that's going to demand new models of how we do things regardless of, of, of any cyclical upturn. Brilliant. Excellent. Uh, uh, great, great, or slightly depressing, very depressing, but nevertheless useful. I mean, sets us up. Emma, add, add your thoughts on, um, you know, where, where you, how you would describe the sort of circumstances you find yourself in at the minute. Yeah, well, I suppose just picking on the house building markets for a moment, I'll leave the, the planning perhaps to, to the next part of the discussion. I think you've got to think about it in two ways, the demand and, uh, and the supply side. Um, I think in terms of demand, what we've seen is this increasingly kind of schizophrenic housing market where you've got um, sort of an international market which has seen some knocks but, you know, I think at the super prime end is probably immune from most things that uh, we try to, to fling at it. Uh, but nonetheless, international purchasing and investing in London, I think, is down. Um, then you've got the sort of mainstream normal market, which has been massively impacted by rising interest rates, as Thomas said, um, but a very interesting corresponding spike in rental growth which I think shows you kind of where people are having to choose to, to live, which is renting rather than buying. And they're seeing um, some quite uh, steamy increases in their annual rent. Um, I think over 7% is the average for 23, which I think, you know, gives you a sense of how stretched people are feeling because wages are possibly not increasing by the same level. And then at the affordable end of the market, you have got increasing waiting lists. Uh, a borough I'm very familiar with in South London, Southwark, I think it's got housing waiting lists of over 16,000 people. Um, they're never going to, to be able to get to the bottom of that list. So I think at, at all um, levels of, of the market on the demand side, there are some pretty perverse things going on. Um, and then the flip of that is obviously the supply side, which is entirely in our planner's hands. Uh, to start with, and, and you've heard from Tom in terms of where the market, the, the, the planning market is going, um, not being able to progress and um, process planning applications as quickly as we might want them to. And then once they get into the hands of the developers, they're subject to rising costs and pressures over trying to create a positive development economic stack that incentivizes people to bring forward um, land, even if you can get a consent on it. So there's there's sort of challenges in in both demand and supply side um, and then with a with a prospect of a general election and a and a new administration with their own ideas on quite how they want to to bring forward economic growth of which housing is an integral part mm. um you know i think a pretty pretty complex situation actually yeah don't know if that yeah. cheers you up or not probably no, not it doesn't but you know but the purpose is not to be cheerful it's to be you know to be honest and to be uh to be clear sighted so that's fine uh um and throw in your kind of two pen -a -thon, um on the state of the of the market where we are with the housing sort of conversation um and then we'll we'll move on to some of the specifics yeah, so I, I think Tom and Emma have kind of really nailed it. You know, there's a bunch of cyclical and structural factors, you know, affecting pretty much every part of the market. Um, at the minute, it's really, um, you know, not a sunny or optimistic time uh, to be in this sector. 
I think there's a strange contrast, though, with how much the politics have really changed over the past year. Like housing and planning have really rocketed up the political agenda after, as Tom was saying, you know, several years of you know a bit of muddling around as to exactly what uh, planning reforms the government wanted to bring forward. Um, we now have a situation where a significant planning bill has been passed, and there is now a consensus, I think, uh, across uh, l- large parts of the political spectrum that we should be doing more on planning. And I think the biggest change over the past year has really been Labour. Right? So there's been a lot of attention um, earlier this year on the conference speech, where obviously it was a really signature part of uh, what they were saying. But I think the really key moment for Labour was actually at the end of last year with the uh, Theresa Villiers rebellion over house building targets, which is part of the um, levelling up uh, and regeneration bill, where I think the penny dropped for a lot of Labour people at that point, that house building and planning was a problem that they would have to deal with but also that politically this is a chance for them to draw a dividing line with the Conservatives. So I think we've seen a bit of kind of, trying to, different parties trying to outflank each other and, and make sure they haven't be, um, uh, don't get boxed in on, on this question. For me, there's two big takeaways, uh, I think, for how the debate has uh, changed, particularly on the Labour side. First is that it's, as Emma was saying, it's all about growth, right? That making it easier to build makes it more construction jobs, makes it easier to absorb investment, higher disposable incomes, higher tax revenues, and all the stuff we've just heard about how we're in the middle of this downturn means less of those things. And that's that's part of the economic challenge which the next government is going to have to face. And uh, it's going to make you know, the economic recovery uh, even more difficult. I think also, secondly, is that currently a lot of the discussion is still about kind of reforms within the planning system, not to it. And this is kind of where Tom's point about how there's no policy stability, there's all this churn it's so frustrating in that it can seem that a lot of effort is being put into changes um, where we're still just standing still at the end of it, right? So, you know, I think a lot of what kind of labor is sort of setting up sounds pretty sensible to me. You know, I maybe disagree with some bits, um, but um, we need to be thinking as well about not just how do we give some policy stability in that short, medium term, but also kind of what are those long term changes that we need uh, to properly and permanently boost house building over the long run. Brilliant. Thanks, Anne. Tom, come back to you for a second. So, I mean, you introduced and then obviously Emran picked it up on the cyclical and structural sort of what's the what's the relative weight of those given, you know, you said we're in the worst state that you can, you know, you can think of in your time in, in the industry. You know, how much weight would you give to the structural versus the cyclical kind of issues? You know, one one hopefully gets better. You know, I mean, one I, may, I think one may I not. Think- I think the worst, in in terms of the kind of it being the worst it's been, that's actually about the planning system and should be fixable and should be fixable by either side. It needs some of that stability. It just needs some consistency. We've thrown everything up in the air and we're waiting to see how it's going to land at the moment. So I think that's fixable. Um, Cyclical, it isn't as bad as the great financial crash, I don't think. Um, certainly isn't in terms of uh, kind of long-term developments and so on. We haven't, it hasn't felt like that at all. So I think there is kind of, uh, there is a way through and out of that. I think the structural elements are going to be really important. I think there is a sense in which some of Labour's thinking, for example, is better or some of the language at conferences almost we can squeeze more out of the developers and we're going to use section 106 to do that etc etc and I think that if you look at where housing associations registered providers are now and their appetite for taking forward and, and building housing and their difficulties over funding and finance and other things I don't think we're going back to that model so I think people are underrating the structural challenges and the people are going to have to think about quite significantly different ways of doing things. Brilliant. Emma, come in on that. What your again the sort of relative weighting of the, you know, of where we are, um, both the structural and cyclical, and just your thoughts on that. Yeah, I don't dispute what Tom said about um the sort of prospects for recovery feel more uh credible here than perhaps uh when compared with with the GFC. But I do think we are we are in a bind. And, you know, I'm particularly interested to see whether or not either party's scale of ambition is, is as it would first appear. I, you know, I too was, am very comforted by what I hear from the opposition talking about the value of, of development, uh, the importance of house building at all 
sections of the market, um, but actually to deliver and execute on on a big vision and a you know a bold ambition, we aren't going to do that unless people are able to follow through with some quite substantial heavyweight force behind it. And my my concern is that there's so many competing issues, whether it's health, whether it's international um, uh, macro kind of geopolitical issues, and you know. It, as, as we saw from the poll, you know, we think house building is, you know, is me- mega critical to, to UK economy and, and, and our prosperity, but relative to other issues and political attention that we might get um, over the course of, of the next year, I just worry a little bit that it, it, it might not appear as prominent as, as it should do, given other things that are going on. And what's your sense, Emma, that, you know, as housing has become, mo- well, become more of an issue over time, um, and you know the degree to which it cuts through onto the into the top three of the government is always you know, is always up for grabs. But it's become more prominent as an issue. Does that then then make polit- policy makers spend more time thinking about it, and therefore you kind of get the things that Tom was alluding to, which is then they look at the planning system, then they say, oh dear, it doesn't seem to be working as we would ideally want it, and then they want to you know they want to do something quite significant about it is a sort of inverse relationship between as the issue gets more prominent they then want to tinker with it more or you know structurally reform it more I don't know what's what's your thought on that I I think it on superficially it looks super easy to crack Uh and I think that's why why governments often often latch on to to you know cracking the planning system and and the need for house building and it, it it it's laudable but I think it once it trickles down into local democracy, I think it becomes increasingly difficult to force change and to to force the IMBI out of out of local authorities. And I think that's why I go back to saying this need for quite bold vision and action is probably what's needed to to crack it. Having three year political cycles where a third of local government is up for re-election often every year is not a way to deliver strategic thinking and action and things become hyper local and super parochial very quickly. Um, and, and so I, I think there's a disconnect, I suppose, mm. what I'm saying between kind of ambition at a party level um, and actually execution on the ground. And so an incoming government will need to be bolder. And I think, dare I say, you know, more deliberate, more directive in terms of what its ex- ex- expectations are of local local government yeah. um, f- for there to see, you know, rampant increases in in delivery or change. Otherwise, I think if you if you leave it to individual uh, 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 local government levels at, at all levels, you know, even even sort of um, mayoral level, I, I don't think you get quite the same conversion of of the vision into into an execution plan yeah yeah okay okay so um big changes or big reform may well be needed because of the scale of the challenge let's let's do this in two sort of stages let's look at um the uh the leveling up act as it is what are you what, you know what are you most interested in what's the best bits of it what are you worried about and then and then we'll move on to looking beyond the act and some of the other things that we might, you know, we, we, we you would need to see in order for us to have a significant positive impact in the, in the future, and whether that's, you know, whether that's a new government or whatever it might be. So, and you kick us off and then we'll do Tom and, and Emma, just, just give us headlines, highlights. What are you most interested about that's in the act? What are you, you know, what are you most excited about? And then we'll come to worries, but do, do what's good first and then we'll do lots of good. Yeah, sure. So I think the two things that really leap out to me from it are the new national development management policies and the new role for the MPPF, the National Planning Policy Framework, um, that the Act sort of sets out. So obviously two two acronyms there. But the NDMPs, which would, in theory, kind of really make central government for the first time a proper referee of the planning system by saying that these are development management policies. So these are the policies that you have to um, comply with in order to get a, a consent. Um, currently, there's lots of variation, there's lots of duplication, there's a lot of uncertainty about how you, you navigate uh, the DM process. The NDMPs should make it simpler um, for applicants um, by setting up for, at the national level, things which we agree should be at the national level will apply everywhere within England. 
And that should also make it easier to get local plans agreed. So by making them shorter, simpler, and more focused on local issues, um, you know, it should be less less of a burden for local authorities, and they've got less of an excuse um, to get them get them agreed. I think as, as well as that, um, the um, national planning policy framework, if that becomes much more focused around plan making and the principles of plan making, rather than this kind of current mix of development management and uh, planning principles, um, will be important. But altogether, I think you know one of the you know, implications of the NDMPs is if we can start to use this within the current planning system to properly establish a hierarchy of language where when a local plan says, you know, this is very important or must give strong weight or significant weight or very significant weight, the NDMPs are a real chance to sort of set out, you know, what do those concerns actually really mean in in policy and, uh, you know, across the country, which should make it easier um, to, to build and to, um, you know, to get more land into the system. Great, excellent, Tom. Give us your what are you what are you excited about? You know what what's good. We'll come to the bads because I'm sure there'll be lots of bads as well. But but let's you know given where we've started, it's all terrible. Let's get some. Let's hopefully get some goods out of the um the act where the act currently is. So what you know what's going on? What do we? Think I'll try. I'll try and come up with some goods. I'm not sure I get excited about planning legislation. <laughs> um, well, you know. but the uh. I mean, I agree, agree with Ant's points. I mean, as a starting point, though, I think one of the things to recognise is that the what the Leveling Up and Regeneration Act is does is give the government tools to do certain things, and those tools in some ways are kind of neutral. So national development management policies could be used to enable development or they could be used to stop development. So in the end, it's going to be political will to do things positively and use those tools positively. I think there is some sense in national development management policies. If you read local plans, as I have to quite often, um, you've you've got 800 to 1,000 page local plans now. They're way too long. No one can understand them. Um, and there is a there's kind of a policy for everything. There is duplication, et cetera. And if you want to move to a system with more certainty in it, I think there is some merit in, in the use of national development management policies and the reforms um, around MPPF uh, that, that Ant's referred to. Um, on CPO, I think some of those kind of reforms are potentially kind of mildly positive. On plan making, it will remain to be seen whether people can hit the timetables and targets, but the plan making proposals about tightening up the plan making process and having it as a kind of uh, a project managed approach, et cetera, et cetera, that all seems to make sense, whether it needed the new legislation to do that or whether it could have kind of been done anyway, speeding up local plans and not taking 10 or 15 years to do a local plan is clearly uh, a positive thing. Um, it will be interesting to see where the government moves forward with the levy. Um, they remain, in theory, committed to it. I think that that's a massive risk at the moment and is also the way it's set up potentially enormously complicated and the transition and everything else is a nightmare. I think we do need to improve how... Section 106 and the community infrastructure levy work and effectively how development taxation works. I'm not sure the levy is the best way to do it, but simplifying those things would be a good move. Um, but it, it feels like it actually makes it worse than better, I think, in many ways, as currently described. Right. And you said, you know, you said obviously it creates, a, it provides a set of tools, but it's essentially, an, you know, it's neutral in obviously then how the tools are. It, was that deliberate in your sense, or was that is that an inevitable way that the legislation is drafted that it has to be kind of neutral to a degree, and then it's up to up to the you know whoever it is in power of the day to to implement it in the way that they see fit. Well, I mean, all legislation is like that, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, legislation setting a, a neutral framework for 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 people to use and for ministers to use, and they can use lots of things in different ways. But thinking about how planning reform potentially goes forward. There were also lots of tools that the government already had as well. And I'm wary of yet more legislation early on when the government can look at what tools it has and see how it can kind of sharpen those and become more focused using those rather than throwing everything up in the air yet again. So I think there's some good stuff in the lab, certainly some useful stuff in it, but the lure as it is now. Um, but 
it's it, yeah it remains to see how it'll be used it's a bit uh, it, potentially a bit of a meddler's charter from the secretary of state um i'll leave that one there yeah no that's yeah well and also we've had a, a couple of questions as as you will know around you know the uh the never-ending sort of thing around cpo land values use hope exchange etc what might we do how might we do it 61 act etc you know so be interested to get your thought on on that in a, in a moment emma just just come in on um what are you happy about in the in the act what you know what what gives you confidence about moving forward and then we'll pick up some of the worries well in the laura as i've now now going to call it thanks for that Tom. <laughs> um uh, I mean, much of much of what's been said already, we agree with. I think on the development management side, increasing fees. Um, you'd never think you'd hear a developer calling for increased planning fees, but I think we feel quite strongly that if that translates into uh, better service delivery, you know, m- more more foresight over over how long the process takes, then that can only be a good thing. And given the the risk and the the capex at stake uh it's a really small thing to increase planning fees i think um as a percentage of of our overall um commitment so that's that feels uh, good from our perspective i suppose the other one i would pick up is the sentiment around focusing and embracing brownfield um and i think given what we were saying at the start of this call around the scale of the ask you know, the, the reticence about uh, rampant house building is always on the green fields. And I think it's always slow and disappointing in terms of its ability to, to deliver. And maybe just maybe brownfield development is going to provide some answer to that. And the lure, I think, uh, and its focus on the value of brownfield development and what it can generate, both in terms of revitalising town centres and our high streets, but also adding to housing um uh housing supply side uh feels uh you know very positive from where we're standing from we did a piece of work with um a another developer called Landsec and Barclay Homes trying to chart kind of what the potential number of homes could be in brownfield development between now and 2035 and on our estimation Uh, In just 16 of the largest urban areas, there was potentially 1.3 million homes to be had between now and 2035. Well, if you look at our average delivery rate to date and the scale of the ask ahead of us, that sort of focus on brownfields and some some perhaps less politically sensitive opportunities for building increases um, in, in, in that kind of development versus greenfield releases feels a sensible place for government to be focusing. Yeah. Um, Tom, come come back to you and then bring others in on, just say a little bit more about what, what about the CPO changes uh, that you're, you know, you're mildly in favour of, you know, you think it will be positive, sorry. I mean, what is it about that? Because this, as it, it's a long contested, long discussed area, right? In terms of if only we could do X, everything would be much, much easier. I just... What's your thought? How far do we get on the on the CPO question? I'm not sure how far we get with the current uh, Lura uh, parts, because, again, it's a bit of a kind of meddler's charter with the Secretary of State being able to designate things, but not necessarily being a general approach. Um, and back to the kind of capacity issues, it feels difficult to see the large scale CPO from local authorities, given their the capacity for them to do everything else that they're currently trying to do at the moment, and those of us who many local authorities do try to use their powers and do use their powers, but it's a it, it, it's a, a complicated and and kind of long term process that you really kind of need to commit to to do. But at the same time, I think trying to simplify that process, particularly for kind of strategic sites and greenfield and those kind of things in the same way as the kind of post-war uh, approach around new towns and kind of designated areas and land values and and setting land values and setting land value expectations. I think those types of things have potentially 
quite a positive role to play. And clearly, if Labour are going to be moving forward with this new Towns idea that they talked about quite a lot at conference, that's going to be part of the approach that they're going to want to take. Yeah. But I think people on the public sector side or on the kind of, dare I say it, think tank side, not necessarily yours, do overstate the uh, extent to which in the short term land values are going to pay for all of the infrastructure because the land values come <laughs> later when you've built it and the infrastructure costs are early and people forget the costs of money and the costs of time so it's not a kind of it's not an immediate solution to anything. And if you look at the new towns, they did pay for themselves, but they paid for themselves over 30 or 40 years, not over five years. So again, that's one of those things where you're looking very long-term if you're seeing that as part of the solution. Yeah, can I get, just add to that, Andrew? So I yeah. think sometimes you get in this debate, people saying, oh, we don't need kind of reforms to the planning system. We just need to grab this kind of, you know, this pot of gold that's sitting underneath um, all, all these landowners' land. I mean, the observation I would make is that when you look at a lot of countries across Europe that do manage to kind of have a big role for the local government and the public sector in buying land, assembling it, and then using some of the uplift of that land value um, to do infrastructure or social housing, they often have zoning systems, so much more rules-based and certain planning systems than the type of system we have, which kind of bundles together both the consent uh, and also the allocation, sort of in qu one quasi-decision. So uh, I don't think it's necessarily the case that you know, we have to choose uh, one or the other. We can definitely have more planning reform and a more simpler and rules-based system that's more spatial um, and also unlock more of this kind of activity as well. Yeah, no, that is a, that is a good point. Um, Emma, you kick us off with, um, and we'll come back to the, we'll come back and pick up some of the goods, but kick us off with things that were in the bill or the act that you're a little bit worried about. I mean, Tom was, you know, talking a little bit, giving some examples of, you know, Medler's chart is kind of a, quite a nice way but obviously concerns about the levy, which you get um, get Tom to say a little bit more about and other things. But Emma, what's what's in the act as you see it that you you would be worried about at this stage? Is there anything that springs to mind? Um, I think there was a sort of a general point uh, for us to sort of reflect on a bit more about the ability for any of these initiatives to translate into action. You know, what needs more legislative primary secondary legislation to actually bring it into effect um, you know and, and are those things urgent uh, in which case might might there have been a bit more focus on those um, I was disappointed I think to see more focus than I think is probably necessary uh, on on this sort of notion of trying to kind of solve the land banking um, issue this sort of long running sore if you like amongst MPs and the Lords that there is significant land banking I, I think there is evidence to to the contrary um and yet i think that got probably a disproportionate amount of, of focus possibly to the detriment of of other more sensible tools which we've already covered already which we'd like to see come into action quickly and which may or may not be able to given um given what further laws need to be passed to to enable that to happen yeah uh yeah land banking is one of those isn't it that um that is often again it's, it's often discussed with lots of deeply held views and yet when you you know the evidence as it is um uh never quite neither quite backs up the very strong views that uh you know that there is extensive land banking going on in the um in the in the system even even uh, when commissioned from within government <laughs> You know, not necessarily always third party think tanks who take a to take a different view. I think some of the government's own research has, yeah. has supported the fact that it's probably not as big an issue as people think. Yeah. Um and give me give me some of the things you're um you're slightly you're slightly worried about at this stage. Yeah, I'm worried that the uh, nutrient neutrality stuff um didn't manage to get its way through. It's kind of um scuppered uh, in the Lords, unfortunately. I think kind of the, the way in which this kind of regulations, um, you know, which were introduced without anyone voting for them, um, have put the planning system on ice on across large parts of England um, is clearly unsustainable. I think we're going to have to go back to primary legislation at some point to unpick that particular problem, um, presumably in the next parliament um, at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think as, as Emma and Tom were saying, I think there's just this kind of broader problem of, um, you know, while kind of on the technical side, I think kind of in, in DLOC, um, there's 
a kind of strong pro-reform sentiment and you know, were issues that aren't floating to the top of the political agenda. Um, oh, where, where, where there are reforms being made that, that aren't kind of capital P uh, political, we're often seeing some quite good progress. But then paradoxically, as planning reform as a whole gets more of the, the political agenda, we're seeing more of these kind of more political interventions that have the potential to you know, throw a spanner in the works of, of the wider uh, planning system. So, um, you know, that, that trade-off between stability and, um, you know, m- making changes to a structurally broken uh, system is going to be difficult. And getting the new NDMPs out quickly, getting the new MPPF out quickly, and we've been waiting over a year for that consultation uh, to come out, um, is, is just going to be really important. And it, I worry we could be left hanging for another year until the next election um, before we see any progress on those issues. Yeah, brilliant. Tom, come in on, um, you, you You touched on the levy point, just expand on that. But I'm also really interested in, you know, your reflections on that last point by Anne, which is, you know, things are thrown out there as ideas or even they come and then the detail takes an inordinate amount of time. And in between there's uncertainty and, you know, and all the rest of it and the kind of corrosive effect of, uh, of that delay or, you know, that slowness. But just other things, you know, talk about the levy and then other things that you're worried about in the act. I'll, I'll spin it around the other way and talk about the other things first, because as Emma knows, I can talk at length about the levy. Um, <laughs> the uh, so on on Ant's point about the that how long it takes to do things, I think one of the problems is that it's just the amount of reform post Brexit has just overwhelmed the capacity of DLUC to be able to carry it through and DEFRA and others. So everything is being reformed at the same time. So yeah. we have the environmental planning system reformed, we, it, we environmental outcome reports and so on. We have uh, the various regulations in relation to that. We have the MPPF, we have the planning system, we have planning obligations. So we've got everything in play at the moment. And it's not surprising that it's really difficult and with a background of government turbulence and changes in ministers and everything else, it's not surprising that we've ended up where we are. So there is a big issue as a next step about just prioritising rather than trying to do everything all at once because everything all at once has been a problem. In terms of the, the actual act itself, the I think the challenge is going to be in what the MPPF looks like because effectively... In the end, the Act itself didn't get amended that much. Loads of amendments were thrown at it um, and some government amendments were accepted. But the deal that the Secretary of State did with the backbenchers was to change the MPPF, not to change the Act. So we'll see what comes out in the MPPF. And obviously the targets and the housing targets thing is the big outstanding question as to what that's going to look like. But that is going to be a big issue um as is how it deals with authorities that don't want to plan for their targets housing delivery test all of that kind of apparatus is uncertain at the moment but would probably be a step backwards if it's published as the previous consultation was published on the levy um my issue with it is that as always in planning everyone tries to triangulate everything and thinks they can have the best of both worlds so we either have section 106 which is very on site and seal which is slightly less on site but isn't as much money and that's a system that delivers things on site delivers effectively delivers public goods on site um by and large or we move to a taxation system which might be more efficient but if you then try and graft an on-site system onto that, which is what the levy tries to do, you're left with all the complexity that you had in the first place and a tax system that's inflexible. And anyone who's tried to make the current seal in-kind arrangements work will say that in-kind levy for affordable housing is at the very least an enormous challenge. So, and given everything else, all of the moving parts I've been describing in the system and the structural and cyclical changes taking place, I think fundamentally changing the the system of effectively planning taxation, betterment taxation at this point is not a good idea. But one that would be an example where, you know, you, you because so much else is going on, 
Uh, and as in, you know, you're not saying that the planning gain system is perfect, but it's one of those where you could probably, you know, it wouldn't be the thing that you would target because of all the other things. And you would just, you know, you would work with it and then see where, see where you get to if, if and when, you know, the system sort of settles down. Is, is, is that fair? Or it... Yeah, I mean, my, my ideal, my advice to whoever wins the election is you need a 10 year plan to deal with this. This is a long term issue. We've had lots of short term responses to things. Again, something that's happened throughout my career under governments of different colours as well. You need that long term strategy. And then you need to work through those kind of priorities in a systematic way. And the immediate ones aren't about doing more primary legislation or throwing everything up. They're taking the new tools you've got, letting it bed down, seeing what more you need to do, and then maybe take some more radical reforms through later once you've got a system that's in place and working. Emma, come in on that. I presume you kind of be in favour of, you know, of that some degree of stability, incremental improvements, but keeping an eye on, you know, some of the then the potential big bottleneck issues that might need to be, you know, might be seriously needed to be dealt with at some point in the future. I would. I mean, I I only wish this was a non-political issue. You know, it was something that had cross-party consensus because I think, you know, if I was a council leader trying to, you know, it, figure out what ought to be the sort of economic and and um housing and job creation of objective for for my district or or um or, or borough i've only got two years at best to deliver on it before we're back in front of our um communities facing re-election and it's just not long enough to be able to uh to to converse anything so in a way giving local authorities top cover um, central government could be hugely helpful in providing quite clear direction on the expectations, um, uh, you know, with consequences, I think, of, of, of those authorities who don't follow through, because that then allows a local democracy to deal with issues that are hyper-local and relevant without trying to solve the big strategic national issues um, in parallel, which they just haven't got enough of a runway to um to do anything about so 10-year plan sounds amazing for me perhaps we should just need a new democratic system you know minimum five-year or 10-year stints for local um local parties in borough or district councils that that's probably a great start but probably a bit beyond our remit yeah no that's a, well it's a, you know political i mean it's a, it's always the sort of classic i mean tom and i have talked about this before you know you, you want you want understandably stability and certainty in order for the system to function and the actors within it. But anybody that comes to the system, particularly their new government of some persuasion or what a new administration says, yes, we agree with stability, but we need just one more heave. If you just believe us that our reforms are the right ones and we'll just do them and then I promise we won't touch the system then for the next 10 years. And it's always that balance. I don't, I don't know. I mean, and can, uh, just a just a thought on, on that. How do we manage the the desire, the need for both stability and, you know, some of the changes that, that you're all in, a, you know, we're all agreeing need, need to need to happen. Do, is it that bigger picture and then you make some tweaks along the way? What's your thought on that? Yes, yeah, so, so, so I agree with Emma and Tom on this. I think you need to think about it in a twin track strategy, right? There's thinking about what are the reforms we need to do now to the existing planning system to get it, you know, off life support and, um, you know, back uh, and functioning the way that it should be. And also then what's that kind of long-term plan where you're making deep, crunchy reforms to the planning system in order to, to permanently increase house building? I think, I think Emma's spot on, right? In that, you know, if, if the planning system is the bottleneck on the economy, the structure of local government we have is really a bottleneck on planning reform. And I think it's one implication of the Leveling Up Act is I think it's now quite difficult to see how you can make further structural improvements to the planning system without um, you know, looking again at the structure of local government and thinking about how you can uh, fix that. T to me, it seems a little bit like you can sort of see the silhouette of a grand bargain you know, slowly coming into view in which you know, you've got the problems in local finance, you've got the problems in local geography, and you've got the problems in the planning system where they're all now sort of, the, the solutions to solving these are now all sort of pointing in the same direction, right? Where greater responsibility, greater powers to local elected leaders at the level of the local economy who are responsible for a bundle 
of things across services and across economic growth. Um, you know, with stronger democratic mandates and also kind of more stability in their local leadership. I think there's kind of a, if you ask people in DLOC, I think, you know, people are kind of thinking, thinking about this stuff, um, there'd be, you know, a, a warm reception to some of that kind of fuzzy agenda. Um, I think the question now is for politicians and, you know, for commentators to really start nailing down, you know, how do we, you know, we're facing all of these problems within local government at the minute. Um, it's sort of almost too big to fix each one individually. How do we put local government back on a new footing so that we can not just make um, the planning system more effective, but also a whole bunch of you know, crucial local services uh, and local democracy uh, functioning the way that it should be as well? Emma, coming on, because it, I mean, that's a big, big kind of question, big picture thing from Ant, which, which is right. But, you know, but you also talked about like a spec very specific thing, which was, um, you know, planning fees, for example, which is a willingness to put more resource into the system in order for decisions to be made more rapidly and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Just, just where do you think now the, the planning system and the resources in it, whether it's officers or just, you know, the capability within it? I mean, how far off? Um, optimal are we in terms of being able to do some of the things that we, you know, on the policy side that we've been we've been talking about? How much more resource needs to be put back into the into the planning system? What's your, have you got a view on that? I do, I do. I mean, we were very supportive of the increase in planning fees, but I think it's it's entirely dependent on there being the planners in the system to be able to to a want to work for local authorities and b for there to be sufficient of them to cope with the the capacity and the demands put on it and we were very um supportive of the announcements i think on both sides both labor and conservatives about the idea of of a sort of super squads amalgamating the kind of the the the, the planners of of most brownfield areas perhaps into a you take london for example you know could, could all the london boroughs combine uh, their planners so that you had this sort of set of of officers who moved with the big schemes around london um not trumping local democracy the decision would still be made by by the planning committee uh, representatives of 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 local councillors, but actually the legwork in processing planning applications is substantial. Um, it takes on average, you know, two years probably to, to process most planning applications. Uh, and there's you know, millions of pounds at, at stake. And so attracting people into the planning uh, profession, attracting them to work for local government is difficult. It's one of the few professions actually where planners can very easily move from the private system into into the public system um, and and often paid a lot more in the private system than 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 working for local government so you've got to attract them in you've got to uh, pay them properly and then you've got to get them to work on some interesting stuff and so actually having having this super squad that allowed them to sort of move with with projects around regions or sub-regions I use London as an, as an example but but the model could work just as easily elsewhere in the country is something I think that is to be welcomed and I think the industry would pay properly for it because it would give you quality of service uh, some certainty over time scales for processing it and and wouldn't trump local democracy mm. in terms of the ultimate decision making so it sort of feels the best of both worlds um, from from our side um, so, so that's something that we welcomed uh, with with open arms, actually. Oh, and and speaking to to peers in the rest of the industry, I think we are all uh, we're all on the same page. It is it is something that we just need to get on and do now. On your thoughts on on that idea, and and I, you know, which is related to you know resources in the system in order for you know literally to have the bodies and the expertise in order to you know to, to implement and and interpret whatever the policies that, you know, are designed by whoever they are designed by. Yeah, I, I support that idea, and particularly on kind of technical issues where individual authorities aren't going to have the kind of expertise to necessarily deal with them. And actually, particularly for some of the authorities outside London, particularly districts who might have a one very large site, um, 
having being able to share those resources is something that could be really positive. I think the other thing, and I've just had a, had a quick look at the chat, but one of the kind of points about that is we've largely talked about process here rather than what the outcomes of good planning looks like. And that's because of the, the, the kind of topic and the, the, mm. the lure and everything else. But I do think that we're not talking about proposing or i'm not talking about proposing something that's deregulation driven it's kind of better regulation driven so that the regulation does the right thing and allows planners and developers and and communities to do really good development in their areas and if we can take some of the weight off the huge amount of documentation and unnecessary assessment in some cases etc that goes in with a modern planning application that can actually take some of the pressure off resources in the local authority where they're trying to deal with they spend, if you've got to write a planning committee report and distill 90,000 pages of of documentation if you can take some of that weight away you can do more on making the scheme better so i do think that a, a, a better approach to regulation can actually end up with better outcomes this isn't about trying to kind of push things through with worse outcomes or not not delivering what everyone wants to deliver around kind of homes and environmental quality etc yeah no, that's andrew the other yeah, thing on, just worth to flag is of course local authorities themselves are hugely constrained in terms of their own budgets so you've got a, a development community prepared to invest in a service but you've got you know challenges around staff uh, attraction staff retention but broader finance and budget challenges within local authorities so you know that there, there isn't necessarily um uh we're not advocating for for deregulation as simon uh, as tom said but there is there is absolutely a case for pooling resources planning i think is a great example but there may well be the need i think for local authorities and i know some are already thinking about it about pooling resources more generally so you could see some efficiency saving some improvement in services some better working with the private sector to try and enable and support that where it's where it's needed that leads to better outcomes um and i think that the super squad is a is is a good start but there could well be other government and council departments that that follow suit yeah, no, that's a great point. Let's use the last um, last five minutes or so. I suppose just think about your reflections on, um, you know, the politics of it. I suppose you know we, you know, election at some point. You talked a little bit about you know housing becoming more of a of an issue uh, across, and it cuts across lots of domains, particularly but not exclusively. Um, the Labour Party and Starmer has been you know been quite vocal about putting housing as kind of a central plank of of any uh labor uh government what, what what is it that we you know what what do you want to see what do you think needs to happen um what would be advocated in, in terms of how it's framed or how we move forward on 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 that over the next you know 12 months what i suppose what what will we want to see or what will you want to see for us to have a feeling that this is serious and significant and you kick us off and then i'll bring Emma in and then and then Tom can have the final word. Yeah, sure thing. So I think it's, it's obviously on reason. Well, even though kind of planning reform is moving up the agenda and house building is, you know, and the housing crisis are kind of electoral issues in a way that they haven't been for, for decades. It, you know, it's obviously unreasonable to expect kind of either the parties to commit to kind of, uh, you know, completely ripping up the planning system, having a completely new one and, you know, imposing that within a single parliament. And it wouldn't be desirable um, for them to kind of make, um, you know, such, such, such a kind of big, um, big, big promise in order to do that, but I think you know it comes back a little bit to thinking about um, you know what is the detail of each party, both in terms of setting up what are their short term aspirations for the planning system, how do they want to improve certainty, and um, you know get the system back on its feet, and then also thinking about in the long term, not just in terms of what do we want the planning system to do or to what to look like, as I think there is increasingly an intellectual consensus about the kind of planning system we would want. We would want it to be more rules-based. We would want it to be more spatial. We would want it to offer more certainty to residents, developers, uh, and to councils. But it's thinking about joining the different bits of the state to actually make that kind of direction possible in future. So this comes back to these questions around 
what are the think what's the thinking about the next phase of devolution beyond the leveling up uh, act how do you get the big cities working you know in terms of their single settlements in terms of the level four devolution deals is it going to be level five level six and then what do you do about kind of local government outside the big cities and you know the metro mayor work model has worked quite well within uh, you know manchester within the west midlands it doesn't seem to necessarily work quite that well in two tier areas where you've got district councils and county councils um, you know, also having uh, you know their their um, you know their, their current role to play uh, within local government. So thinking about what's that long term picture and a long term view of local government and how these things slot together, I think is the key thing that I'd be looking for um, in any manifesto. Good. Okay, Emma. What what you know? What will we? What should we keep an eye out for in terms of knowing that you know it's easy to say, oh, I'm going to build you know four fifteen uh, one point five million homes in the next parliament. We've heard that. Lots of time. What will we need to look out for is to know whether that's remotely a serious uh, proposition? I think it's got to translate into what works and means something at a local level. I think there's 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 the Labour Party and the Tory manifestos, which are national policy positions. But what I want to see is the case for growth being laid out in individual boroughs and districts. And and what I mean by that is what am I as a voter going to see as a result? We have this, this very negative culture towards development, particularly house building, and yet we don't talk about the virtues that it brings in terms of job creation, in terms of economic investment, in terms of spend back in the high street, community benefits, healthcare benefits. That sort of positive case for development needs to be made locally. I think only then will you see people leaning but you know leaning into it and and seeing it as a as a positive uh indicator for for a party that they should support um i don't think it's enough just for there to be a a, a huge national number to to shoot for if it doesn't mean anything uh, sort of in terms of a hyper local situation yeah great yeah tom final thought from from you as to you know what we should what would you expect what would you want to see to know that this is this has been taken seriously I think starting off, I think Emma's points are really good when it comes back to my point about the tools being neutral and everything else is the culture around realising that it, it, a demonstrating that development is a good thing. The whole we work on it, we work on this day in, day out. The assumption is that you have to mitigate the impacts of housing because housing is bad. That feels like the starting point of the discussion. In fact, housing contributes huge, hugely to human welfare and that should be a, a kind of starting point for discussion and then leading on from that the need for economic growth and the reason why in the end I'm optimistic about change is because I just don't think we can go on like this and in either government if it wants to have economic growth and be able to fund all the other things it wants to fund needs to make sure that among other things good housing development comes forward in terms of the kind of practicalities i'm not sure we'll see that much um i think we'll see some stuff in the manifesto and we'll see some headlines i think what we'd like to think was going on in the background and maybe sue gray is whipping everyone into line is actually having a plan so that the day you go through that door you have things that you are going to do because this isn't going to wait. You can't, whoever goes in and becomes the new housing and planning minister is going to have a really full agenda and they just need to be prepared to govern rather than to write a manifesto, which is a completely different thing. A great, uh, great insight to finish on uh, 159. So we're going to, uh, we're going to call it a day, but we could carry on for it. Thank you to my uh, panelists, to Tom, to Emma and to Ant. Uh, thanks, everybody, for um, for coming and uh, joining, asking or putting lots of questions. I think we covered them, uh, uh, quite a lot of them in in, um, in principle in terms of the things that were uh, covered. And we will definitely um, come back to this issue in due course, because I think over the next 12 months, as uh, all three have said, it's not going away. And I think it is quite a significant issue um, and will be a significant uh, issue in the run up to the next general election. So until the next time, take care and go well. Thank you very much indeed. Bye for now.